Uh, so good, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us once again. We are very excited about uh, this evening's uh, program, Pay to Slay, How Bad Is It Really? Uh, presented by uh, Sander Gerber. And uh, Eddie Sugar uh, will formally introduce uh, our speaker this evening um, uh, and introduce the program. Before we begin, I just wanted to mention that uh, you know Eddie and his wife, Rebecca, are uh, dear friends and members of Fifth Avenue Synagogue. I know uh, from firsthand experience how they are both uh, highly involved and dedicated to the Jewish world. Um, they have a strong, strong passion to the state of Israel. Uh, he's involved in a number of projects, including, I believe, a CSS, you know, the volunteer uh, security initiative that many shuls use. Rebecca and I worked together for uh, you know, over a decade in Birthright Alumni, also very engaged in, uh, in a number of um, uh, initiatives for the Jewish uh, community. Besides a commitment to the uh, community at large, they are also very dear friends and supporters on many levels of the Fifth Avenue Synagogue. Uh, Eddie joins our daily minion every morning, um, you know, uh, consistently for, for quite some time now. And we study together every week as well. Used to be in person. Now uh, we do it uh, remotely. And he's a, he's a great, great guy and a dear friend. And we only wish uh, Eddie and Rebecca good health and continued success for many, 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 many years and great uh, joy from their wonderful children, Nate and, and Cora. And um, please God, you know, we should have, uh, we should celebrate many happy occasions with them as a community for years to come. Oh, man. And also, well, well put, Rabbi. Yeah? Well put. <laughs> Okay, so Eddie, uh, it's uh, the ball's in your court. So um, I'm the one who's supposed to be introducing somebody, not the rabbi introducing me, but thank you very much, Rabbi. Um, and it's a pleasure to be part of the minion and part of the shul. Um, so I have the unique privilege of introducing our guest tonight, which is Sander Gerber. Um, I probably am one of the few people on the phone that probably deal with him both philanthrop in philanthropy and in business. Um, he is CEO and Chief Investment Officer of Hudson Bay Capital very successful hedge fund, multi-billion dollar hedge fund, investing uh, throughout the capital structure around the world. Um, more importantly for tonight, Mr. Gerber is also involved in global political activism and was a key citizen activist who um, created and pushed for the passage of the Taylor Force Act, a bipartisan and paradigm shifting anti-terrorism bill in November 2017, Mr. Gerber was awarded the JINSA's 2017 Henry M. Scoop Jackson Distinguished Service Award for championing the Taylor Force Act. He was also named by the Alzheimer as one of the top 100 people positively influenced Jewish life. I think the point that is not made in this, which you have in your email, was that um, he experienced a lot of opposition for what he was doing when he did this. And despite that, um, and most people telling him he couldn't get this done, he per, uh, persevered and made sure to get this through. And we I all know- I was pissed. Um, sorry? I was pissed. <laughs> um, I'll let you give the color on that, but I'm saying I know what went on behind closed doors, so to speak. Um, and to his credit um, and his determination was able to uh, complete this. Um, obviously, he's been very active in the Jewish community in many other um, venues. Um, he was on the board of directors for APAC from 2004 to 2016. In June 2005, Mr. Gerber was sent by President Bush to represent the United States at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe Conference on Anti-Semitism and Other Intolerances in uh, Spain. In February of 2006, the President appointed Mr. Gerber to a trustee of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, where he served as chairman of the Investment Management Committee and as member of the Audit Committee. Additionally, in December of 2008, the president appointed Mr. Gerber to be vice chairman of the Wilson Center for a six-year term, where he served until 2016. In May of 2008, President Bush invited Mr. Gerber to join the U.S. Honorary Delegation attending the celebration of the 60th anniversary of the State of Israel in Yerushalayim. He is a fellow and board member of the Jerusalem Center of Public Affairs, board member of American Conservative Union, distinguished fellow of JINSA, um, a member of the Council of Foreign Relations and the New York Economic Club. Mr. Gerber graduated cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Wharton, and a BA from Humanistic Philosophy from the 
from the same college. Um, I will hand over to you now. Um, it is amazing what you are able to do in both areas of your life, considering how much time both of those things would take. So I commend you again and hand over to you, Sander. Well, thanks, Eddie. But the, you know, the rabbi spoke very well that you and uh, your wife are really paragons of uh, community involvement. And thanks for introducing me. It's a great honor to have you of all people uh, introduce me. Thanks. So, so uh, Sander, th thank you again for, um, I know we have a lot of ground to cover tonight, but I really appreciate you uh, addressing our community on pay for slay. Before we get to that, I know you have some videos you want to educate the community on. If you can talk a little bit, and Eddie, thank you for everything you do for the show and your introduction. Um, Pleasure. Sander, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, we're a synagogue and, uh, you know, I know you considered moving to the east side, but uh, we haven't given up on uh, you coming at some point. But uh, if you can just tell us more about your Jewish background, uh, which will lead into uh, tonight's discussion, please. Well, thank you. You know, Fifth Avenue is um, my favorite shul on the east side um, because uh, it's Hamish. You know, it's a prominent kahila, but it's Hamish. And um, if my wife would let me leave the west side, I would be with you. Um, and as I told you before, several of my children were named um, under Robert Kermeyer <coughs> at the shul. I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan. So I'm from, you know, the Midwest. And uh, my parents are conservative, uh, not Shomer Shabbos, um, but traditional. I had a very strong sense of Jewish identity, uh, went away to college, uh, kind of got lassoed um, by Asha Torah in college and uh, saw the light. And, um, you know, now I'm blessed with uh, seven children, Kanai Nahora, um, living in a building that's two-thirds Shomer Shabbos that has a shul in it. What could be better? Th thanks for sharing that. Can you uh, talk about, um, you were on the board of APAC, so kind of how'd you get involved with Jewish activism? Was there a mentor of yours when you were younger? <coughs> like, what, you know, what, what, what motivated you to put such an enormous amount of time? Well, when my wife and I got married, um, uh, we determined that we needed to get a Jewish education. So we went the summer, uh, every August for a couple summers, we went to rent a home in the old city of Jerusalem, uh, studied at the Asia Tour Executive Learning Center. Um, and uh, we had a wonderful time. And then the Intifada started. And when the Intifada started, by this time we had three kids. I determined that I couldn't bring my kids back to, you know, this focal point of violence. And so I called up um, a friend of mine who had also been studying every summer with us, <coughs> who was a Democratic Congressman, Peter Deutsch. And Peter, I said, Peter, what can I do to help out? I felt very um, embarrassed that I was letting, you know, the Palestinian Intifada prevent me learning with the family in Jerusalem. And so Peter said, join APAC, it's the most you could do. And my dad also had been saying, join APAC, it's the most you could do. So uh, I joined APAC. So, so tell, talk, talk about that before we talk, Pay. So you were, you, were, you were on the senior board of APAC for over a decade, correct? Yeah, I was uh, 12 years on the National Board of Directors, which meant that um, once a month, uh, I would go down to Washington for a day of briefings and then a day of lobbying on the Hill. Wow, that's a, that's a long time. Okay, Sandor, do you now want to talk about pay to slay and, and, and show the video presentation? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that um, I want to spend about 10 minutes showing people what pay for slay is all about because I don't think people recognize how bad this really is. Um, <clears throat> pay for slay. Even what it is. Or even what it is. Pay for slay is a, a term that was coined by a message maker, um, John Crouchar, who I think is the best in the business, because you needed something that was going to create a semantic infiltration, something that would carry in yeah, the Yeah, I've mind. never heard that phrase. Until. Well, what I want to do is I want to show um, the background to it so that you can understand uh, what really goes into it. So here is, I'm just going to spend under 10 minutes on this. This is a boss meeting with a 14 year old kid after he tried to stab Israelis and he was released from administrative detention. This is a boss meeting with 
the matriarch of terror. And she's a famous woman in the territories because she has four sons serving life sentence and one son is a martyr. And so he's always um, hanging out with her. This is the PA Minister of Women's Affair who says that a Palestinian woman is unique because she receives the news of her son's martyrdom with cries of joy. This kid um, killed 13-year-old Halal Ariel, dual US Israeli citizen, knifed her in her bed. This is the mother saying, my son is a hero, he made me proud. <clears throat> this poster is, um, uh, these three boys are in a soccer club, but this is their martyr poster. They killed an Israeli policewoman. Um, this is the mother of one handing out candies and the father of the other one saying, we receive with joy, he's a martyr. And the club in um, the official PA Daily says, um, you know, Allah should welcome them into uh, paradise. This is Taylor Force. And so the Taylor Force was built around Taylor. His family are special, wonderful people. They're amazing. Uh, Taylor was captain of the West Point ski team, uh, served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, he was killed between Tel Aviv and Yafo. No one else was killed, just Taylor. No one else was killed. This is Taylor's uh, murder, which they call a martyr. And so this is Fatah. Fatah is, Arif is um, not just Arafat's party, that's Abbas's party. So you see the date is um, uh, March 8th, 16. And uh, this is, his, he's the Shaheed champion. Now I'm gonna show you a video that's one minute that I showed to about mm, 20 US senators. And this video really, um, really got them. And uh, let's see here. Okay. You can see this uh, video start? No, not yet. Right, but you see the video, right? Okay, so th this is the regular PA, typical news like your evening news. This is the evening news about the killer of uh, Taylor Force. So stop share and start again. Santa, that's Sheila telling you what to do. Uh, to stop share and start again, please. Stop share and start again, okay. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Sheila. What, what I want you to show is how this is like normal in um, the Palestinian Authority that they're recognizing someone who killed um, an American, an American West Point graduate. Raise the voice, okay. Oh gosh. أن تكون عرسا وطنيا كبيرا يليق بالشهداء وإلى مثواه الأخير في مقبرة شهداء حجة شيعة الشيء رغم المماطلة من الجانب الإسرائيلي والتسويف في عملية تسليم إسرائيل الشهيد الضغط الوطنية الفلسطينية لم تفسر بالضغط دوليا وسياسيا على الطرف الآخر من أجل تسليم إسرائيل الشهيد ورغم كل ما فعله في النهاية انتصرت الإرادة الفلسطينية وسلمنا جثمان الشهيد بسم الله رب العالمين الشهيد بشار بصالح 22 عاما ارتقى في مدينة يابا في الثامن من شهر آذار So what I'm trying to demonstrate there is how this is like uh, a normal evening news. It's not like he even killed an Israeli. He only killed an American uh, retired serviceman. Now, this is not <clears throat> um, unusual by any stretch. Um, 60 nuts. seconds. I'm going to show you the fastest way to become a millionaire. No. Right now, there are over 1,700. Uh, we'll, we'll talk it through. Sorry about this. No problem. We, Zoom technical difficulty. It happens all the time. Oh, yeah.
So, <laughs> so, 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 Sander, d- d- just to be clear for everyone on this call, on the so the tale of the um, the Palestinians, basically, you know, from our conversation, they pay, you know, on a simplistic level that they, if, if you kill a Jew. They'll pay you X. You get paid, right? So I'm. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna show you the actual laws, but I'm gonna spend one more minute just to drill into you, um, so you can really understand how bad this is. Because it was really an eye-opening experience for me, because I had no idea this was going on when I found out about this at the end of 15. Um, not only did I have no idea this was going on, but I called up Joe Lieberman and Eric Cantor. They had no idea what was going on. Um, I spoke to uh, Boogie Alone, Lindsey Graham, Aaron David Miller. David McCuskey, Ellie Groner in the Prime Minister's office, uh, Dory Gold. Now, they knew, those people knew that there were payments going on, but they didn't realize that these payments were institutionalized, and they didn't realize that these payments were $350 million a year. And they were all collectively shocked by it. And that's why Lindsay uh, went ahead and introduced the Taylor Force Act. But can you see this? um, Can you see what I'm sharing now? July 2017. Yeah. So, so these are honor guards for attempted stabbing attack, attempted stabbing attack, attempted stabbing attack, shooting attack, stabbing attack, deadly car ramming. Uh, this is the terrorist bodies being returned, uh, suicide bombing. <laughs> these are official honor guards. So this is not like, uh, you know, a few bad guys getting together. These have PA security force insignias on their berets. These are official. It's like um, Arlington. You know, um, <coughs> let's see. The one that this one, Schumer liked this one because this is uh, a boss giving his respect to the guy from Black September who did the Munich Olympics. So this is a boss giving a state funeral to uh, a senior planner of the Munich uh, Olympics. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to go and show you the actual laws because this just doesn't come out of thin air. You know, there's a reason why, there's a reason why this, this went about. And this is by design within the Palestinian uh, uh, bureaucracy, they determined a way to, um, a way to create this. Let me see here. So, so, so on a simplistic level, Sanders, uh, just so we understand. So, so in other words, it, it, they go and they solicit people to do this, or if you go and you kill someone, you get paid. How, how <coughs> can, can you see the? Am I sh- sharing the screen now properly? Yes, amended Palestinian prisoner law. Okay, so the law was first codified in 2004, and under Article One, a prisoner is anyone incarcerated in the occupation's prisons for his participation in the struggle against the occupation. So you have to be participating in the struggle against the occupation. You can't be a car thief. You can't be, you know, like stealing from a drugstore. You gotta be struggling against the occupation. Article two, the prisoners and released prisoners are a fighting sector. You have to be a fighter. An integral part of the fabric of Arab Palestinian society. We are gonna glorify our fighters. The provisions of this law guarantee them and their families a dignified life. And down below article three, the prisoners' children get an education, uh, <coughs> little six guaranteed release prisoners' positions. Then here in article seven, there's a monthly salary. If you look in point one, it says that the sum will be linked to the cost of living index. So you know, oftentimes we think that this is like a banana republic, but they actually went so far as to think that we have to index the salary for the terrorist to a COLA. Got it. So there's a whole series of uh, decrees that, and then in 2010, they enumerated um, a schedule for the payments. And this schedule for payments basically um, is the more serious your attack, the more money you get paid. Well, how proxy, do you find serious? The proxy for it is based upon the imprisonment. So the longer you're imprisoned, the higher your monthly salary. <laughs> so if you're um, if you're imprisoned for five to ten years, you're four thousand shekels a month. But what's interesting, if you go on the left side of the chart, if you're a Jerusalem resident, they pay you more, an additional three hundred shekels a month. 
So in other words, Jerusalem residents are paid a bonus for terror versus if you're not living in Jerusalem. And then on the far left, there's an additional 500 if you're uh, an Arab Israeli. So if you're Arab Israeli, you get 500. If you're a Jerusalem resident, you get an additional 300 for each month. So they're really trying to target the foment, the foment of revolution against Israel. Remember, this is Palestinian Authority law. This is not Hamas. This is not Hezbollah. This is not Iran. This is Palestinian Authority law trying to create the culture that I just showed you in the pictures. Now, in 2013, they upgraded the law where they said the period of incarceration is the time actively spent in prison, whether continuous or intermittent. So you see now a lot of women being arrested at checkpoints saying, uh, arrest me, I'm going to, to commit an attack. And later here, if a woman is, spends two years in jail, whether continuous or intermittent, she gets an annuity for the rest of her life. If a man spends five years in jail, he gets an annuity for the rest of his life. But if a woman spends more than five years in jail and a man more than 10 years, then the PA has to create a new job for the terrorist in their bureaucracy, which is why they have succeeded in creating a bureaucracy by the terrorists for the terrorists. If you look at Article 8, it says the state will continue paying the salaries of released prisoners employed as civil servants. Uh, little four on Article 8, if the salary of released prisoner is lower than the salary he received in prison, the state will make up the difference. And this was signed by Abbas uh, Jan 8 of 2013. Now, the same thing is that's prisoners. Prisoner is someone who survives the attack. A martyr is someone who uh, dies in the attack. So the martyr is in a different category, but they have the same schedule of payments for them. And this is what I first found, which was really shocking, Jacob, when I first found this in um, <coughs> January of 16. The Palestinian Authority budget online, in Arabic, online. The top part is for prisoners. Now this doesn't go to prisons. This only goes to individuals. These monies are only going to prisoners in Israeli jails. It's $124 million. The bottom section is for martyrs. That's $173 million. When I first saw this, I said, oh my goodness, you know, maybe it's a total of 173 million. Prisoners are part of that. No, these are separate line items in the budget that were online. It's a total of $300 million in 2014. And then if you move on to, uh, to uh, 2019, it's 300, 2018 is $350 million total. 160 million for prisoners and $190 million for martyrs. So what you have here is something, you know, I saw your interview with Abe Foxman and um, you know, it, it was about anti-Semitism and it was a great interview. And he said that, I believe he said that in the United States, we haven't had deaths from anti-Semitism before now in the last hundred years. Yes. And um, I can't think of anything more anti-Semitic than what I just showed you. So, so, so Sander, walk us through the process. So you learned, you're, you're on the board of, senior board of APAC in 2015, 2016. You, all of a sudden you became aware of this? How did that process come about? <laughs> what happened was um, I was training for the uh, New York Marathon on the treadmill and I'm listening to the Wilson Center where I was vice chairman and Aaron David Miller, who was Dennis Ross's deputy in Oslo, he had an event on um, the knifing intifada. And everyone's bashing Israel for the knifing intifada saying it was Israel's fault. <clears throat> and I called up Aaron and I said, you gotta take this off the website. You know, everyone's bashing Israel. Even the New York Times correspondent said, um, no one's defending the Israeli position. And this is during the knifing intifada. Can you imagine? Like, um, this is like October of 15. And I said to Aaron, don't you know the terrorists are paid? And he said, well, you gotta talk to Jane about that. Now, Jane Harmon, former uh, chairwoman of House Intelligence Committee was the head of the center. And I called Jane and I said, Jane, don't you know the terrorists are paid? And she said, no, I didn't know they're paid. And then Tom Nides, 
who might become a senior uh, administration fellow with Biden now. Uh, he was chairman of the Wilson Center. He was deputy secretary of state under Hillary Clinton. It's the same thing. He said, I didn't know they're paid. And I said, well, hmm. I mean, I think they're paid because, you know, everyone kind of heard that, uh, you know, Iran was paying them, Hamas was paying them. I didn't know who was paying them, but I, I knew someone was paying them, sort of. So I said, you know, if I'm going to be saying this to people, I need to find the facts. And I don't know if it's because I run a hedge fund, but, you know, I have certain research abilities. So it was very easy. I called up the um, Palestinian Media Watch and Memory, who are the two leading translators of Arabic press. And I called out each of them and I said, <laughs> are the terrorists paid? And they said, sure, they're paid. And I said, well, how are they paid? They said they're paid by law. And I said, what do you mean they're paid by law? And they said, well, the Palestinian Authority has laws to pay the terrorists. I said, the Palestinian Authority? I mean, that wasn't even on my wavelength because for 12 years, I've been going to lobby on behalf of the U.S.-Israel relationship. I had no idea that this was going on. I had no clue. And so I said, well, get me the laws. So it took them about a month and they got me the laws. Now, originally, they only got me the laws for prisoners. And because apparently people had thought that this was welfare payments for martyrs. <clears throat> but when I prevailed upon them to get me the um, institution of the martyrs thing, then they realized that no, this is also a, a um, you know, it, it's, it's a way to pay for, for violence. So um, yeah, I was pretty floored. I was, I was really floored by this. So, so, okay, so you're now in 2016, you did all the research and then, and then what, what was your next step? You get all the information and then what do you do? My next step was that I went to Ed Royce, chairman of House Foreign Affairs Committee. From California, did, right? from uh, okay. Ed Royce's California? He was, yeah. Yeah. And a uh, super guy. And uh, he started raising it um, in some hearings. Um, and then we determined that we would have a hearing on the House Foreign Affairs Committee on this issue. And uh, <clears throat> the staffers tried to muck it up. So the staffers tried to not focus on payments for terror. <clears throat> but at the last moment, we worked things in kind of, so it was sort of in there. But we always faced this um, issue that people were trying to kind of bury the truth. It was, it was an uncomfortable truth that you know, the interlocutor for peace is actually paying to kill Jews. And um, it took a lot of effort to convince people that first this was morally wrong and unacceptable. And there was a false notion that the Israeli government was completely against making this known. Why? There was a feeling, there was a feeling that if Republican senators found out about pay for slay, they would introduce legislation to cut off aid to the PA and the PA would collapse. And then Hamas or ISIL would move into the territories and things would be much worse. And this was a view of a certain part of the Israeli military establishment. But like any military establishment, there is a range of perspectives. So one way I addressed that was I had Amos Yadlin and Boogie Alone write a piece in the Jerusalem Post saying that pay for slay was a red line for stability of the PA. In other words, we can tolerate a lot of things. We cannot tolerate pay for slay. And when they wrote that, um, that made a big impact. And then the Commanders for Peace, which is 250 you know, senior Israeli military people came out saying, no, no, this would be terrible to cut off aid to the PA. But then a group of much more senior 20, um, you know, general staff generals wrote a counter letter to that. Um, along the way, you know, I realized two things. I realized two things because of the dramatic opposition I was facing. <clears throat> One was that I need to have a succinct message. The other thing was that I needed a legitimacy. Now, I got no legitimacy. I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I run a hedge fund. So Dory Gold is an old friend of mine. And Dory Gold at the time was 
director of the Foreign Ministry of Israel. So believe me, I was in touch with Dory as director general of the Foreign Ministry. I was in touch with Dermer. I was in touch with all kinds of people who were all telling me, go, go, go. And uh, other people in the States were telling me, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. Just to be clear, you cultivated these relationships through APAC or on your own over the last, I mean, not, not many people have access to these names you're throwing around. I would say that it was initially through APAC, yeah. But, you know, I, I, I um, Dory, now I'm a fellow at his center and I'm on the board of the Jerusalem Center of Public Affairs. And uh, yeah, I mean, from APAC, because for 12 years, I went every month to Washington. And also as vice chairman of the Woodrow Wilson Center, it's kind of a big deal. And that gave me access to um, Bob Corker and all kinds of other people that I wouldn't ordinarily be in touch with. But I knew that I needed legitimacy. So um, with Yossi Cooperwasser, who was the general who, who was in charge of strategic affairs for the IDF. Okay. Um, so he was like the strategy guy, the strategy general for the IDF under Boogie alone. And uh, we co-wrote a piece on the history of pay for slay. So the information I showed you, those laws, you know, and more, we came out with a whole piece. Uh, I was the co-author. And then I was told that if I'm the co-author, I would have to resign from APAC. So I instead wrote the foreword to it but I was still asked to resign. So I resigned, you know, I resigned. I figured that was fine, you know, because it was, it was difficult for people, even though you'd think this is like so obvious, it's not so obvious. You know, there's all kinds of considerations. People don't want to overstep boundaries. And, you know, a lot of people try to do good things <laughs> and they overstep boundaries. And that kind of creates problems. Now, I had the fortunate position that I was in touch with enough of policy leaders in uh, Israel and in the United States that I felt comfortable um, with what I was doing. Um, but I still asked a Shila of my son's uh, Rebbe, Rabbi Stern of the Passaic Yeshiva. I went to him, spent an hour and a half with him, laid out everything. I said, you know, is this something that I should work on or, you know, is this something that's overstepping my bounds? And he said, his answer to me was, I have no idea. And, you know, Rabbi Stern is the MS. So, um, but, you know, it's, it's like we're dealing in gray area, even though we're dealing with something that's like morally so clear. There are actually laws to kill Jews on the books. And there's a budget of $350 million each year. It's crazy. Still things were not crystal clear in terms of what to do. So, so tell me about that process. W were you frustrated? I mean, it, it, was, it, it seems like it's so obvious you're doing something so great, but it sounds like even people who are your friends that you've been working with weren't really supporting you. I mean, how did you respond to that? Well, um, I read a lot about Peter Bergson. Have you heard of Peter Bergson? I haven't. So Peter Bergson is someone that everyone should study. Peter Bergson, Lahavdil, did a lot more than me. A great hero. But he faced off against the institutional Jewish community during the Shoah that did not want to raise the issue with Roosevelt because they were worried that post-war it would affect Jewish immigration to Israel. And they were worried that raising the Shoah with Roosevelt <coughs> would um, hurt would hurt the Jews because it would be called the Jewish War. So there is history um, in our community of you know moral clarity being disrupted by other considerations. And uh, you know, look, I I knew I was motivated to Shem Shemayim. I um, I did. I had partners. I mean, I had a lot of partners. You know, Christians United for Israel were amazing. Of course, the former executive director of Christians United for Israel is a Yid, and he was amazing. <laughs> uh, Republican Jewish Coalition was amazing. OU was amazing. Um, the RJC is Sheldon Edelson's organization that you're involved yes. with? Yeah. And then uh, eventually JINSA came in, and JINSA really pulled it 
over the uh, finish line. So these organizations did get in. It wasn't like everyone was against me. <laughs> it's just that there were a lot of people that felt that they couldn't overstep their boundaries on something that even seems so morally clear just because, you know, their lay leadership. A lot of times the professional leadership in um, the Jewish community tries to let the lay leadership think that they don't have the savoir faire to make the right decisions. And sometimes they're right and sometimes they're not right. But so so you, you have this conviction, you speak to your rabbis, you know it's right. And it sounds like you're just looking to find the right organizations that have the courage to support you is what I'm hearing you say. Well, yeah, there's more than that. Um, and maybe now I'll show the video. Sure. Um, so I, with um, John Krauschar, who is an expert message maker. Okay. We crafted a video. Um, I lobbied myself individually, um, congressmen to show them uh, this information. Um, let's see if I can get this working. Okay. Uh, I don't know where I got this ice cube thing here. We can, we can send everything out in a package tomorrow if anything wasn't clear. Can you see this? Uh, it, it, it's getting it's loading. Ready. It's loading. Did you know that hundreds of Turn a little louder. Your tax dollars fund the Palestinian Authority, which pays sound terrorists when they kill. The PA rewards lifetime payments to imprisoned terrorists and families of killed terrorists. Yes, this is actual Palestinian law, money for murder. In March of 2016, a Palestinian terrorist snuck into Israel and stabbed to death Taylor Force, a West Point graduate and a veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan who was visiting Israel as part of his MBA studies. Israeli police killed the terrorist, but the Palestinian Authority rewarded the terrorist family with lifetime payments for what they called as heroic martyrdom for Islam. Taylor Force's parents asked why. The news reports show celebrating in the streets Palestine, saying they had that they'd taken out a serviceman in America, and, and I just totally could not understand how how a people could think like that. And I still don't know. I don't. Different value systems, different approach to life. There's no sense supporting people that want to do us harm. Senator Lindsey Graham explains the Taylor Force Act, the bill that he and Senators Dan Coats and Roy Blunt introduced to stop using our tax dollars to fund the Palestinian Authority until the PA stops funding terrorism. I want the American people to know that this bill is not a result of animosity toward the Palestinian people. It is pushback against state-sponsored terrorism. If you're seeking a two-state solution, that one state cannot be a sponsor of terrorism. Terrorists are not martyrs, they're murderers. Tell your elected official to stop using your tax money as blood money and pay to slay. Visit stopmoneyformurder.org. So we, we built a website for, um, to house the documentation material so that reporters had a destination to go to. We crafted pay for slay. We had this video. I went one by one throughout the Senate. Uh, Chaim Saban put me in front of uh, Chuck Schumer, which was instrumental in Sorry, getting the Democrats. Who's, who's, may I want to lower your voice? Who's Chaim Saban? I mean, the, <coughs> who is Chaim Saban? I'm sorry. Chaim is uh, you know, one of the leading Democratic funders out of California. OK. By the way, who, who's, are you single-handedly funding this whole process, or did you have some help? Because, I mean, this is. I assume it was costly, right? Uh, this thing cost me about $250,000. Wow. I mean, for, for what you accomplished, that's amazing. On an ROI. Um, Kufi helped. Kufi hosted the video, but they wouldn't pay for that video. Okay. I had to pay for the video. Um, and uh, with uh, Stuart Force and Robbie, who are really lovely people. I mean, they are super, super people. Um, we went around, you know, talking about it. 
Um, we went to Congress. Ed Royce walked me over to see Bob Corker. I showed Bob Corker the stuff that I showed you. Corker looked up and said, wow, this is really rewarding terrorism. And then Corker really got involved. And it was Corker's effort in the Senate that really pushed it over the um, finish line. Corker, and then uh, getting it through the committee, and then uh, Schumer in the end, uh, Schumer came on very, very strong for this. So, so, so walk us through the process. Is it a one-year process, two-year process? Are you doing this <laughs> full time? And it sounds like a lot of work. This I've was like, um, well, I found out about this end of 15. And then the Taylor Force Act was passed in uh, March of 18. So a little over two years. Um, you know, for my 50th birthday, they made a video. I'm going around, everyone's going around saying, can you believe it? Can you believe it? Because I'd go around the office with the, as, as I'd uncover all these nuggets about what's going on, I say, can you believe this is happening? Because it wasn't being referenced anywhere. You know, like for, for 12 years, I go to Washington, I had no idea this is happening. And it's actually laws to kill Jews. I was like, can you believe it? It's insane. People, even today, people can't really believe it's happening. However, the Palestinian Authority outright admits it. Their difference is they say, these people are not terrorists, they're our fighters. They're not terrorists, they're our fighters. But whether they're terrorists or fighters, they're civilians killing civilians. They're paying for violence. So, so, so that you get the Taylor Force Act passed in 2018, and and so that's is about 700 million dollars was going to help fund this from from the United States, correct? And now, and explain the Taylor Force Act better, please. So the Taylor Force Act says that. Um, the United States will not fund, um, will not provide funding that will benefit the Palestinian Authority until they revoke the laws to kill the Jews and cancel the budget to kill the Jews. And the Taylor Force Act also says the United States will make known an in international forum that the pay for slay program exists. Okay, so, so from 2018 to 2020, I assume they haven't gotten funding? Right. So that's uh, one uh, billion for. Well, it's, it's a little more complicated. $700 million includes money to UNRWA. So UNRWA is actually outside of the Taylor Force Act. Trump decided to cut off all aid to the Palestinian ter ter territories, not just the, the money was actually going to the PA was somewhere around 300 million. But in the Taylor Force Act, they carved out 75 million for security assistance and 50 million for the East Jerusalem Hospital Network. This was part of the compromise between the Democrats and the Republicans to still care for the Palestinian people. They allowed some money still in. But, you know, again, the point of the Taylor Force Act was never to force the PA to change because I knew they were not going to change. The, the, the PA has a $4.8 billion budget. They're spending 350 million to pay terrorists. Um, you know, if the U.S. cuts off the money to the PA of around 300 million dollars, that's not going to cause them to say we're not going to do it. But what I did after this, and this came out of um, at the Trump inauguration, there was a Shabbos lunch, and Ed Royce spoke, and Ed Royce called me out for the Taylor Force Act, and a friend of mine was there. <laughs> and uh, Rifka Kidron, and she said, you need to show this to General Elazar Stern. Elazar Stern is on the security committee of the Knesset, a former major general, retired major general. So I went through and showed him in more detail the stuff that I showed you. He and Avi Dichter went and introduced into the Knesset a law saying that, um, the tax revenues that Israel collects for the Palestinian Authority will be reduced by the amount of money that the PA pays terrorists. Wow. And this law passed 87 to 15 in the Knesset in July. July of what year? July of 18. And this law was actually very difficult to pass because 
<coughs> it was all clear. And then Netanyahu at the last moment wanted to have a prime minister waiver. Just like with Taylor Forrest, we had no presidential waiver, which is kind of a big deal because usually these things always have presidential waiver and we did it without a waiver. How, how are you able to accomplish that without a waiver? We uh, organized a team of victims organizations in Israel, uh, built websites, had them come and lobby the Knesset uh, in person, physically. Um, we put price tags on Jews' heads. Every time there was a victim, we made sure that um, Mariv or whatever it was had like a price tag placed on, on the, the Jews' head. Um, so we really raised the profile of pay for slay in Israel. And um, in the end, uh, Dichter stood up to Netanyahu and uh, give him a lot of credit. Now, Dichter, you have to remember, was head of the Shabak. So there's no one better who understands the implications of cutting off money to the PA than Avi Dichter. And the vote in the Knesset was overwhelming. So, you know, Israel has like this dual civilian military track which sometimes manifests itself in the confusion over Qatar, right? Is Qatar good or bad, right? The, the politicos say Qatar is evil, but Yossi Cohen goes over it all the time. The former general who was in charge of Kogat is on payroll. This general who's in charge of dealing with Palestinians retired two years ago. He's on the payroll of Qatar. So it's very, very confusing in terms of what's, um, it, you know, in terms of what's going on. But the, the legislator, the Knesset overwhelmingly, and nothing passes 87 to 15. The people against were the Arab parties, and I think maybe one lefty, but everyone else voted for it. Um, so it was really resounding. And, and that impact is still being felt today. Just, um, just yesterday, there were statements uh, around this by Yisrael Katz. So, so t talk a little bit about uh, a new administration, the Taylor Force Act. You're saying, could, could they undo all the work you've done, God forbid? Um, they, could, uh, they could reinstitute, Trump went beyond the Taylor Force Act. So <coughs> uh, Biden could restore much funding that's not supposed to go to the PA, that's ostensibly supposed to help the Palestinian people. Problem with much of that funding is it kind of seeps through the cracks. Like UNRWA, for instance, much of the UNRWA personnel in certain areas are like really Hamas operatives. Um, and UNRWA itself has been known to be extremely corrupt and stealing money from the people. So yeah, I mean, they could say, we wanna help the Palestinian people by funding the United Nations Relief Works Agency, thinking that they're helping the Palestinian people. Actually, uh, as you probably know, the textbooks, the UNRWA textbooks, which are based on the official PA textbooks, still um, glorify violence against Jews today. So, so, so even though you've done all this great work and it, and it, it got passed, you're saying, you know, uh, that there are ways to circumvent it, but, you know, God forbid. <laughs> There's ways to circumvent parts of it, but, you know, it, it is the law. And it's going to be a problem for them to try to overturn <coughs> the law. Right. And you and I assume you still have all the marketing material, the videos. If they do overturn it, you, you would go back to work and you keep on educating them on, on, on what's going on, right? Yeah, I don't think no one's going to overturn the Taylor Force Act. The issue is, are they going to find funding avenues to help the ostensibly help the Palestinian people, but in reality, strengthen the Palestinian Authority? in the hopes that these people are uh, peace loving and for normalization. And, and what, you, what was passed in the Knesset, I assume that that's more long-term stable, that you don't, they can't undermine your efforts there, right? Correct. Okay, so, so, so uh, maybe if you could just share, so, so you put, uh, sounds like a good three years into this, right? Yes. Give or take? Yeah. So, uh, you know, for people listening on the call, you know, is there any uh, any advice you want to give? Meaning, you know, is at the end of the day, just to sum up, it sounds like you had the credibility through your efforts over, it was like mazel, you're in the right place at the right time. Had you started this 15 years ago, you wouldn't have had the connections. So you right. had the connections at the right time when you had the education. Yes. So, you know, 
let me ask you a different question. I mean, why do you think it took you so long to get educated? I mean, now that it's so obvious to you, you know, it bothered you so much. I mean, why do you think so many people are uneducated? Right. So that's the big question is there's laws to kill the Jews. Why is it a secret? Yeah. Crazy. So, so what happened in Israel is that the division of the IDF that's responsible for being the interlocutor with the Palestinians is called Kogat. Kogat officers <coughs> are just interlocutors. They're not, a uh, central command is in charge of security in the territories. Kogat's not in charge of security in the territories. However, if the PA were to collapse, Kogat would have to move in and provide uh, human services in the territories. Kogat's not prepared to do that. They're not staffed to do that. Kogat made the decision that we have to keep the PA in power because there's only a handful of Jews being killed a year. There's many more being wounded. Israelis are generally happy. So, I'm sorry, they don't get paid for wounding and you have to kill a Jew to get paid. No, no, no you, get, you get killed for wounded also. You get paid for wounding, okay. You get, any, any fighting against uh, Israel, you get paid. And it has to be an Israeli? If you kill an American, you don't get paid, right? It has to be an Israeli. No, Taylor Force, his martyr was paid. Okay. So, no. In, in Israel, I'm saying, but it, it, they don't try to attack people in the United States. Ah, no, 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 because actually part of the laws they didn't show you handles attacks against Israeli targets outside of um, Israel. Really? So if you attack terrorists on a bus in Bulgaria, you get paid. Got it. Okay, I didn't realize that. So, so it doesn't matter where, where they are, as long as you do it, you get, you get compensated. In fact, I'm trying to figure out now, it just dawned on me that Sirhan Sirhan, who killed RFK, would qualify for the program. Okay. So, 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 so your feeling is the program is still- That's before your time probably, Jacob, right? Sirhan Sirhan? We're not, I'm not, I'm not, you're not that much older. Yeah, Sirhan Sirhan, it was a very, Robert F. Kennedy was killed by a Palestinian terrorist in I think oh, 65. I it's that. a very big deal. If he's paid today by the PA, there was a, 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 a Barnard graduate who was killed in 1996. They wrote a book called The Bus on Jaffa Road. She was from um, uh, Teaneck or Tenafly, Sarah Duker. She was killed with her boyfriend, Matt Eisenberg, who was at JTS. The terrorist mastermind is sitting in an Israeli jail, has admitted that he killed them. He is currently getting payments from the PA. So, so at the end of the day, you, you said your mission was to educate the world. Do, yes. do, do you feel like the world is educated or you, you feel like we have a long way to go? It's a process. So, 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 so you're early on in the process. So, well, so I mean, there are other countries that have started to um, reduce um, payments to the PA. Uh, Australia, uh, Denmark, um, Sweden. Through your efforts or indirectly through your efforts? <clears throat> Well, I, th I think that this created the, the, it's not just me. So Palestinian Media Watch is very into this uh, memory. There's a whole team of people that drew some center of public affairs. This kind of broke the barrier by creating the pay for slay moniker that enabled a focused, um, uh, a way to focus the mind on what's really going on because it, it's just too hard to believe what's going on. So so, 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 Sam, there's some questions on the chat, but, but to tell me, you know, you put an enormous amount of time. I don't know many people that have, I mean, you took a quarter million dollars in an enormous amount of time. You got a lot done. It seems like in a short period of time for people that have been in Congress for 50 years. So, so, you know, what's your goal? Where would you like to go with this? In other words, it sounds like you're not done. So, so, so to tell us, you know, going forward, you know. Here, here's my thought. You know, as you spoke with uh, Abe Foxman, a lot of people think that um, there's a, a disease called anti-Semitism. That's what he said. And that that's responsible for the BDS movement, uh, <clears throat> the anti-Israel hatred around the world. I have a different tack. I don't think that's the case. 
I think that the issue is who's responsible for the plight of the Palestinian people? Who is responsible for the plight of the Palestinian people? The world has been convinced that Israel is responsible for the plight of the Palestinian people because of the occupation. So even well-meaning people believe this. Now, look, there are some crazy people on the left and on the right that really are true anti-Semites. And, you know, we're not gonna be able to change them. But for a very large number of people that I come in contact with all the time, I believe it just upsets them that they believe that the Palestinian people are beleaguered because of Israel. What I wanna show is that the Palestinian Authority is responsible for the plight of the Palestinian people. And I think that this helped lead to the whole Abraham Accord. I, I did go around to various Gulf capitals and showed the same material that I showed you in the Gulf capitals. I'm certainly not claiming any responsibility for at all for the Abraham Accords, but it's part of the mosaic that when people start to realize that the Palestinian Authority is not, is not a legitimate ruling um, a representative of the Palestinian people. They're not a legitimate ruling representative of the Palestinian people. Then you can open up your minds for other solutions. So, so it sounds like it's really all about education from what yes. I'm hearing you say. Yes. So, so what's the plan or what's your vision to educate the world? <laughs> well, I was working on Europe but then uh, BDS just passed at Columbia and my son was at Columbia. And I think that we need a new language to fight BDS. I don't think that the existing language um, will change hearts and minds of well-meaning people. Okay. I think the new language could be BDS is BS. <laughs> BDS is BS. It's bad for the Palestinian people because the Palestinian Authority steals from them. It's dishonest because the Palestinian Authority pays money for terror instead of um, for jobs. And it sabotages Palestinian children because it brings them up to be uh, for violence. Got it. So, so, so you're working on a plan to, to do some marketing? Because I mean, clearly you're, the messaging you said earlier is, is super important. Because yeah. it sounds like you, you lobby the right people you got the right messaging, you got Bob Corker, you said, you got Ed Royce, and therefore it's sort of, to, you know, you got, you got Charles Schumer. So you, you got both sides of the table. So- And Menendez and a, a lot of, uh, and Cardin and, you know, everyone that I was able to sit down with and actually show them this packet to was on board. Everyone that I was not able to sit down with, I could not get on board. I'm a Republican. So I was able to get before like 2025, Republican senators, they were great. The Democrats, I needed friends to help me get in front of Democrats when if I could speak just to their staff, it never made it through. Interesting. Interesting. So so the so the, the so the, the you're talking about more about the college campuses when you said Columbia. So you feel like the college the college campuses are really educating in the wrong way as far as people are misguided. Absolutely. Yeah. And the college campuses, they really believe young Jews believe that Israel is a racist apartheid state. And it's very upsetting to them because so, their identity is based around Israel and they don't have a sense of pride. In fact, they have a sense of shame. So, so have you spoken on college campuses? Have you, have you done like little <laughs> weekends or what's your plan to reach that demographic? I, I have this. This all started and COVID kind of shut things down. And, and Zoom is not appropriate, right? You have to do everything in person. No, you, you got to do in person. But um, I don't think that I'm the best proxy to go speak on college campuses. You know, as you mentioned, you got to have the right relationships. I'm 53. I'm not a college student anymore. You know, I'm not the right guy to go speak on uh, college campuses. There are organizations um, <coughs> that I'm working with. Um, to try to foster this um, idea on college campuses. But, you know, these things take time to seep in. Pay for Slay took a long time to catch hold. And as you know, it still hasn't caught hold throughout um, everywhere. Although now that, you know, people on this call have heard it, 
I'm sure they'll see references to it um, in the media. Yes. And, and I, you know, I feel, um, I feel for myself, I can speak that, you know, just the educational level of you coming on tonight and, and sharing your story and your success and educating us. I, I think, you know, we all have networks, we all have friends. We're going to send out tonight's video to everyone on the call and people that weren't able to make it. And I, I, I do think that will help in, in an enormous way. But, uh, but it sounds like, so you're involved with organizations that are focused on college campuses and, and you feel like the, they're better messengers to del deliver it than you are personally. Yes. Okay. And I'm a fellow at JINSA and Jerusalem Center of Public Affairs to keep pushing this on uh, you know, the governmental level. Okay. But, so just because it came out on the chat, so the UA deal, can, can you talk a little bit about the magnitude, you know, how great that is and what that really means you know, going forward? UA deal is really, really a big deal. And the reason why is because it represents a paradigm shift. The, the belief before was, as John Kerry said, Israel and the Palestinians need to make peace. After Israel and the Palestinians, only after Israel and the Palestinians make peace, can the rest of the world, rest of the region um, start to have relations with Israel. What the UAE and Bahrain did was they said, no, we're not waiting for the Palestinians anymore. We're removing their veto. The Palestinian Authority had this veto that they tried to exercise on the Bahrain conference where Jared Kushner tried to give them $50 billion. And the Palestinian Authority said, we don't want your money and people shouldn't come to the conference. And I think this was continued rejectionism by the Palestinian Authority eventually uh, with the application of Israeli sovereignty gave a great reason to trade that for normalization of relations. And I've spent um, extensive time in the Gulf and uh, there might be some bad apples there, but I've had extremely positive experiences in the Gulf. And uh, in fact, so much so that a lot of the Gulfies view the Jews as their cousins, literally as their cousins. I had a a friend of mine hosted a dinner for my family in Riyadh and he built a kosher oven in the ground for us. We flew in a mishkiach from Dubai. Uh, this was uh, 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 over after, a year ago. After he wanted us to have the traditional Saudi fish. So he built this oven. He's just a regular guy. He's not government or anything. He's just a guy. And then he ho had like 30 of his buddies over. Uh, with their wives and had a big party for all of us and it was like a kosher meal in Riyadh. It's lovely. So, so the UAE deal, you know, will be a super positive way to, uh, you know, move things forward, for sure. It's a great start, 100%. Okay, great. All right, just in, in the interest of time, you know, hopefully you'll come back and address our community at a later time. Is there, any, you know, is there anything that you feel we didn't cover tonight? You know, there, there, are, there are a lot of questions coming in and we'll, we'll try to address them if you have a couple of moments. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about this evening? No, I, I think it was a great conversation and uh, it's a lot of information, obviously. And uh, I think you were an excellent interviewer. It was a great honor. It's a prominent Kahila and thanks for listening. Okay, Sandra, well, we haven't given up on you uh, joining our, our community at some point. Huh. So, uh, Hopefully this was a good recruitment, but 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 uh, I mean it sincerely. How impressive it is what you've done, and I really appreciate uh, what you do for the entire Jewish world, and uh, you know for giving us uh, your time tonight to educate us on something so important and so vital uh, to the world. Thank you so much, and thank you everyone for joining. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you, thank you. <laughs>